that. So I, I'd like to introduce our next spe uh, speaker, Dr. Nick Bailey from Columbia. Um, he is the director of the Migratory Ecological Program in Selva. Nick's love of birds started at the age six when he grew up in the UK. Uh, and has been the motivation ever since. In 2003, he completed his PhD on migratory birds and three years later was leading the first independent research project on neotropical migrants in Belize. For the last 12 years, he's been one of the driving forces behind the Colombian NGO Salva, where he's developed a successful migratory bird research and conservation program that today focuses on multi-species and includes projects across Latin American countries. Nick devotes considerable time to building capacity in the neotropical region through training workshops, supervising students, and by investing in local biologists. Nick, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy, and good morning to everybody. So <clears throat> now on our road to recovery journey, we're heading to the neotropical non-breeding grounds. And for the next 10 minutes, we're going to be spending most of our time in Colombia. So I want to begin by not thinking about co-production in terms of conservation implementation, but starting with the science. So I think it's no secret to anybody in the audience that for many of the steeply declining uh, North American birds, the major information gaps are often for long distance migratory birds on their neotropical wintering grounds. And that means there's still considerable opportunities to think about how we can introduce co-production into this first stage, this information generation. And I would really argue that this is, this is critical for several reasons, because by involving uh, individuals from the countries where these birds are wintering, both designing and implementing and hopefully having local leaders uh, leading these research in initiatives to fill these critical questions. We're not only getting buy-in from in-country biologists and conservation, but we're forming the next generation of migratory bird champions. And what this really does is it's creating a lasting local capacity for the future. And it's this capacity that will then go on and hopefully be the implementers of many of the recommendations that may come out of this research. So to illustrate how this can work, I want to show you briefly an example from the Near Tropical Flyways project. The Near Tropical Flyways project has the goal of identifying, enhancing and protecting critical stopover regions within the near tropics. And it's very much uh, developed under the co-production model where we have a, a strong alliance between North American institutions and Latin American organizations who are leading the work on the ground and leading much of the analysis and, and data production as well. And really this model of co-production and drawing what I describe as an ever-growing pool of Latin American talent is fundamental for a project at this scale. It would be impossible using many traditional research models to cover the number of uh, study sites um, that we're trying to cover in this project. As you can see in this map below, each black spot, each black dot represents a study site. So what we need in this project is to be able to find local individuals who can carry out the research activities in all of these different regions throughout the major neotropical flyway. And that means thinking outside the box a little bit when we look for who's going to undertake that research and moving away from thinking that it must be biology students or people with research experience, but really just drawing on the pool of people who have an interest in birds. And that can vary from individuals like Jose Luis Pushaina, a member of the indigenous Waju community and bird guide, to park guards, to master's students, um, and to just bird enthusiasts within the general region. So we really need to be drawing on all these people in order to be able to um, cover the, the amount of ground that this project is attempting to cover. And this, not, this model not only leads to fantastic data as we can see in this map where you're actually seeing high use areas for a community of 20 long distance migratory birds in Northern Colombia during spring migration, but leads to these unexpected outcomes of the co-production model. So as a result of working with individuals from each of these regions, we've had several conservation success stories linked to the project. For example, in the uh, Serenia de Aribe in Northwestern Colombia, Carlos Brand, who joined the project as a biologist, but primarily as, as a bird guide for bird tours, 
Um, he has gone on to establish a tree nursery on his farm, undertake restoration activities and education activities. Marta Rubio in the Darien region, a critical um, bottleneck for millions of migratory birds. Uh, she was simply, Simantia, a bird enthusiast, has now become a migration junkie and is leading fantastic environmental education efforts with uh, children from the local village. And Fundacion Iguairaja housed one of our uh, constant effort um, migration monitoring stations on the lands they manage. And as that has now turned over two years, have been forged into a strong partnership where they are now undertaking restoration activities in the region for species like black pole warbler that arrive there after a, their phenomenal trans-oceanic flight from North America. So I hope by this very brief example, it's clear that investing in local capacity within the near tropical region pays. I just want to suggest a couple of ways that we might think about doing that that aren't necessarily on all of our radars. One of those is actually funding in countries masters or PhD student um, programs. And I see this as a critical way to to create that next generation of migratory bird champions and ensure that there's an incentive for them to stay in their countries and not migrate north as many have done following the birds that they study. We should also be thinking about tiered funding programs for migratory birds where we start with small investments and then gradually build the careers of conservation biologists and scientists, much as the Rufford Small Grants Foundation program has done and launched thousands of uh, conservation careers across the world, or as the Coastal Solutions Program led by, by Cornell is attempting to do. So I'll move on from that example of thinking about co-production in science to now talking about what co-production might look like when we implement recommendations on the ground. And for that, we're gonna move to uh, the Andes, a critical wintering area for several steeply declining uh, near tropical migrants, such as the cerulean warbler, olive-sided flycatcher, Canada warbler, to name a few. And to give a little bit of background to these examples, uh, we'll briefly dip into the science here. So what we recently did was to take the eBird STEM models in order to start to understand where are the critical areas or population centers for many of these species on the wintering grounds, and in this case, in Colombia. And by overlapping these distributions for multiple species, it begins to become a clear picture of that certain areas of the, Colum of the Colombian Andes are more important than others. And the main point I want to uh, draw your attention to from this, from this work is that when we focus in on where these areas are on the Andes, and here they're pictured in yellow and red, we begin to realize that they are largely outside of protected areas. And that means they are on private lands in the Colombian context, and these are largely working lands. So working in these areas is gonna be fundamental to being able to recover these populations. And it's worth mentioning that there are several studies now showing that uh, population declines are directly linked to habitat loss, specifically in the Eastern Andes of Colombia here. So to talk about how that co-production might work, I'm gonna go through three examples. Two of them uh, are real and one of them is, is in the pipeline. Um, and these are focused on what we are now defining as migrant scapes uh, within the Colombian Andes that you can see pictured on the left here. So in our first example, we're gonna to go to the East Andes Orinoco migrant scape, which is on the Eastern slope of the East Andes in Colombia. And in, the, in this region, it's a region dominated by cattle pastures, but also with shade grown cacao. The former is not a good habitat for many of these long distance migratory birds, while shade grown cacao is a fantastic habitat. And what we realized here is that we don't need to focus the actions on the birds because the habitat exists in the form of these shade grown cacao plantations. So what we need to do is focus on farmers' needs. And what it really boils down to is the question is, how can we make these cacao farms profitable? How can we make them compete with other land uses to ensure they not only exist on the landscape, but multiply? And so to that end, rather than focusing on birds, for the last five years, we have been working with two cacao growing associations in this region and providing them with technical, technical assistance. What do I mean by that? I mean, helping them ensure or increase productivity levels, ensuring that their products are of high quality and also cutting out the middleman and ensuring they have direct access to markets and they're producing their own cacao based products. 
And this has been successful in both maintaining shade-grown cacao on the landscape and the cerulean warblers that are occupying it, um, and also providing an incentive to increase the amount of cacao in the region. Now to our second example, we move over to the central Andes of Colombia. And this project uh, began as, a, as an attempt to recover populations of two endemic bird species. It began with a year of research to really understand where the population centers of these birds were, and then was followed up by a series of uh, social scientists led interviews with, with communities within critical regions, and then followed up with uh, a large community workshop in which we talked with communities about these birds, but also about what they wanted to do, what they were interested in doing on their lands and how they might contribute to recovering these and other birds associated such as migratory birds. And following on from that, from us as scientists, we developed a series of best practices they could implement that we thought would have the maximum benefit for populations of birds within these regions. And then we took this list of best practices to local landowners and asked them, which of these would you actually implement? Which ones are you, are you interested in implementing? And that helped us kind of whittle down what we call our toolkit of potential actions um, that could be implemented within this area. And as a result, we've been working over the last three years with landowners um, and have planted over 15,000 trees. There are a number of private nature reserves um, in the process of being declared, among other success stories with this program. But what is, uh, notable about these last two examples is relatively speaking the scale at which they work is quite small and we're still not working at the scale which could actually impact some of these migratory bird populations wintering in the Andes. So to that end we're trying to take these messages to a much broader audience. So now that we've learned what farmers are prepared to do and we also understand the benefits of these actions, not only to birds, but also to farmers in terms of things like increasing pollinization rates or, or conserving water supplies. And we're trying to take this message to a much broader audience and hopefully be reaching thousands of individuals through these social media products. And so I want to finish with my final example, um, which is, now kind of combining these different elephant elements and thinking about how we can take them to scale. And here what we've decided is, is one route is to basically activate individuals. A number of speakers have, have spoken about this in recent days, but many individuals want to contribute, but they don't have the skills to. And so in this case, we're thinking about the idea of holding restoration workshops where we give farmers, landowners, the skills to actually undertake ecological restoration and support them through small but competitive grants that will provide an economic stimulus as has proved very successful with the implementation of silver pasture systems throughout Latin America, but also not leave them alone in the process. So make sure that technical assistance is available, but available to multiple communities over a much wider region. And this is what we think co-production might look like in the future if we really want to scale this up to, to thousands of farms and therefore actually protect and create habitat for migratory birds at a scale which is really gonna change the fortune of their populations. Um, so thank you very much for listening to this. And there are a huge number of people to thank, which isn't possible here. And I will hand you back to Wendy, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. I hope all of you are seeing this trend of investing in and time and money into the local well-being of communities, their peoples, and for species recovery. And so on that note, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the final speaker of our session. And that's uh, Dr. Sarai Contreras Martinez. She's a full-time professor at the Department of Ecology and Natural Resources uh, at the University of Guadalajara. She's coordinated and developed several educational, social outreach and scientific research projects on ecology, conservation of land birds in Western Mexico, especially with hummingbirds and passerines. All of her projects are applied in conservation management, restoration of habitats and temperate subtropical mountainous forests and response to local and international needs. Sarai is also won in 2019 the Partners in Flight Award for Investigations. And it's with our pleasure I introduce Sarai. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks 
to invite me to share my experience collaborating with the Western Hummingbird Partnership as a professor at the University of Guadalajara. The Western Hummingbird Partnership, WHP, was created in 2009 with a mission to work together to maintain thriving hummingbird population and their habitats throughout Western North America. So WHP is a developing network of partners collaborating to build an effective and sustainable hummingbird conservation program through these three circles, science-based monitoring and research, education outreach, habitat restoration and enhancement. Ah, sorry, and these are ongoing projects that we already have in the present. I, I think you can see and see just quickly. Uh, we share seven species of long distance hummingbird. And as you can see here, Rufus. Rufus is one of the birds with a special concern. We recognize that share several species of land birds and in all these west part of North America. And PIF has developed two strategies of eco at ecosystem level, western forest and tropical deciduous forest. The western forest strategy identify the human activities or contributing factors that contribute to the threats that most degrade ecosystem on which Western forest birds depend through the full annual cycle. And in this table that you see here, we show the six most substantial threats along with the human driving contribution factors that Western forest birds face. And you can see in Mexico is almost red. Fires are one of the main threats in Western Mexico. In response to the Rosenberg et al. 2019 signs, the WHP is expanding on existing collaboration and program advising false life cycles signs to identify the primary causes of hummingbird declines. We outlined five management practices in the US Forest Service GTR that will benefit Rufus hummingbirds habitats and habitats for other empiral Western hummingbirds. And this brings us to my work with fires and hummingbirds on their winter habitats in the high elevation pine forest of Western Mexico. Fires is an essential, essential ecological factor relating to Rufus hummingbird habitat needs. And WHP partners are working to integrate fire management practices that will benefit Rufus hummingbirds through all their annual cycles. So in this state of Rufus hummingbird document, WHP apply aspect of the Western forest strategies to addressing conservation needs for the Rufus hummingbirds and partners who fly watch list species, Rufus. In this, Way. In a country with environmental and cultural complexity that Mexico has, it is necessary to identify local priorities at the local level and establish plans and mechanisms on action on a scale or greater resolution. Finding the mechanisms to provide adequate and timely advice to decision makers and politician actors to influence together with social in general, the root causes of biodiversity loss. This is an example on how we try to accomplish the conservation of goals in Mexico. Science base allows evaluating the effect of fire bases on severity and time since the last fire to know the community-based response on hummingbirds. And as you can see here, we can have different responses depend on the, uh, the species of hummingbird, but all these 10 species are the species for temperate, uh, temperate forests in Western Mexico. And as you can see here in, in this part of the graph, some response uh, differently, it depends after the fire. You know, they are positive, like Rufus and all these, uh, and Berlins and these species. 
and also other uh, if there are fires they will respond negatively like mf sting um, hummingbird but other it looks like that's in response to that because they respond to other variables principally like platycercus or broadtail hummingbirds on or bumblebee hummingbird that responds to the temper, uh, temperate uh, climate weather. So the study area, as you can see, we are in Jalisco, and I work this in this biosphere reserve protected area. And these polygons we have been working to create and regulate uh, the benefit rufous habitats in almost 400 hectares in temperate forests. And let me tell you that Rufus is one of the most abundant species in the shrub layer of the forest. Uh, I analyzed like 70 uh, species and Rufus is the second uh, abundant species. So we understand that to conserve the, uh, the entire hummingbird community, we need to keep forest fire with the historical regime. We need to maintain a mosaic of different successional ecological stage. We have the managers. We need to give a managers a precise information to carry out prescribed fires to conserve rufous, but also we need to maintain some other kind of uh, forest because uh, we need to conserve the endemic species or resident species. So. We try to work in an interdisciplinary team, and we have brought together many institutions to manage the prescribed fires. So to answer how do we make the social approach to prioritize the conservation of hummingbirds, it's very important to distinguish three these steps. First, we uh, determine the conservation problem. And the problem can be different in each community, even that we are inside of the biosphere reserve, because they have different types of vegetation. Uh, so when we determine the conservation problem, like fires in a temperate forest, and they are linking with the agriculture practice, we carry out a multidisciplinary process where communication is generated with the different institutions of between different institutions and the people who own the ecosystem or natural resources. Socioeconomic situation and biological cultural values are evaluated to give uh, or to help these people and the results are based on sociological theories about multi, multi, multifunctionality, endogenous importance to ensure sustainable social development. So the project is recognized. Wait, yeah. We have developed our project with, within a multiple species view to maintain the functionality of the ecosystem, addressing the main problems that local people present. As a prof professor, I had to develop three main functions, such as teaching, outreach, and research. And I think this way, as the university asked to work, is a very good way to, uh, to maintain uh, the research and work with people in the field. So um, the other thing is from my department, sustainable development is based on the social environmental system where the management of natural resources is composed of the use of resources, restoration and conservation. The project is recognized by the different um, secretaries of the environmental at federal level and even in the very local level like Ejido and we are working in Huacapan Ejido and I'm very happy that we have two years on implementing these different goals and all the green ones working with land major managers implement prescribed fires even with the COVID and uh, to work um, uh, with monitoring uh, the flowers and hummingbirds even 
the uh, insecurity in on this place and to consider the cultural implication, we accomplish all 100% of goals. So now we are in the final evaluate the success of the program and we need to quantify different uh, hummingbirds and, and the benefits of the habitat. And I bring this a special um, scheme just to say that we have different focus uh, groups to work. And one I bring here is uh, working with uh, women's in Awakapan. Women's in Awakapan and women's as a professor make uh, a strong uh, bond and work with uh, the HIDO uh, director boards and also with the board of the uh, this uh, protected area. And this gave, and, and this what I say, endogenous uh, way to respect and do different activities that they didn't have before, but now we are like the transition to rescue the values and make through festivals to, to uh, workshops and uh, ecotourism activities. And that it will, it, it has been very successful. So this is my last, um slide and the strategy uh, that we have across all scales as you can see these are the local uh, people very local community indigenous women and also we have the state uh, uh, institutions and the national institutions that we were international institution i think all these in, uh, interrelate uh, uh, efforts and we want to to respond to 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 protect the uh, rufus hummingbird and also what i have here is that all documents that are international document and also national and very local documents jointly define the context of the problem and help to understand the problems and use the science appropriately and thank you so much Thank you so much, Sari, for that excellent presentation. I hope all of you realize what an impossible task it was for these colleagues to squish in 20 years of research and co-production into a 10 minute talk. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing uh, my Road to Recovery colleague and Partners in Flight colleague, uh, Tom Will, who is apparently retired but seems to me be still working as much as he did, maybe even more so. He will now be leading us and moderating this session for the, our panel discussion. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Wendy. Um, wow, there was such a, such a wealth of material that was just presented. Um, I hardly know where to begin. I was like, we spanned geographies from Canada to, to Colombia, we looked at, ways of looking at just a single species to working with multiple species and species groups like migratory birds in general, and then looking at whole ecosystem and management, as well as some of the details of, of how that can happen that at really local scales with communities. Um, I think that what I'm seeing right away is that uh, the road to recovery needs to devote maybe a week to talking about international work and, and you know, really zeroing in on some of the great things that people have done. So thanks again to um, to you, Sarai, and and to Christine and to Nick for your presentations. So in order to help me work with this a little bit, I'm going to call in four additional people to work to serve on the panel. Edwin Juarez, who uh, works for the Arizona Bird Conservation Initiative, who um, officially works for the Arizona Game and Fish Department, so state representative. Uh, Claudia Macias, who is conservation director at Pro Natura Sur. Thank you, Claudia, for joining us. And oh, Claudia also got the 2020 Partners in Flight Leadership Award. So yay. Sorry, he actually. Oh. <laughs> um, and then uh, Kristen Nelson, who's currently a professor in environmental sociology at the University of Minnesota and has worked extensively in, uh, lived and worked for five years in Nicaragua and Chiapas, Mexico. And then finally, Umberto uh, Berlanga, who works with Canabio. Uh, and I think that what's Canabio, the national 
um, National Commission for Conservation and Use of Biodiversity, something like that. Yeah, more or less. Um, and everybody knows um, Umberto and Partners in Flight Networks because he's been a major contributor to many of our publications. So uh, what I'm going to do is ask each of you um, who just joined to say just a very few words about where you where you intersect with bird conservation in in Latin America or or Canada and um, and then reflect a little bit on what you saw as the the strengths pull out the themes that you think most resonated with the ideas of incorporating social science and co-production and especially working across multiple cultures um, both your own and other cultures in order to do uh, move bird conservation forward. So a little bit about yourself and then, you know, reflect on what you heard from the three speakers. So let's, um, let's start with you, Claudia. You, you need to unmute yourself. Or adjust your, adjust which, uh, which microphone you're using. So while we while you're figuring that out, and maybe um, maybe you can get some help from, I think you're you're you've got something's not on. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It was working before, but anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be in this, this panel and to be hearing all, all these very interesting and essential topics for doing conservation, the three issues. I, I agree that those are essential when we're talking about conservation. Um, I'm a, a biologist that um, and have been focusing uh, my work on birds, on bird conservation. And in Pronatura, we have more than 30 years focusing also, also on bird, bird conservation, resident and migratory species, especially those um, threatened species. And then we have been trying all these years, more than 10, 30 years of work, trying to link our work on birds uh, with habitat ecosystem conservation. And like, uh, facing all the challenges that have been uh, arising uh, all the along this time, so it was difficult for us to to work with um, the land owners uh, with in Chiapas in south of Mexico. More than eighty percent of the land tenure belongs to the community, so we need to do social science when we we talk about conservation. And, but it was difficult for us to figure out how to include bird conservation on forestry, on mangrove, or rainforest um, ecosystem conservation. So we, uh, we first were uh, analyzing the threats. What are the threats for those ecosystems? And uh, what we should do to face or to, to tackle those threats? And then... Uh, of course, working with landowners, uh, we we frame our work on thinking more on the needs they have. They they and, and the needs they have is are very basic, very essential for living, like water, soil protection, uh, food, uh, a more stable livelihoods. So we start thinking what we should do and what is the best. Um, the, the best way to preserve, to conserve these ecosystems, but also to provide a good, uh, a stable livelihoods to the people. So that took us to focus or work for more than 15 years on forest, community forestry. So what we have been doing is, it's um, a lot of things related to forestry, community forestry, from building capacity, working on legal issues, markets, uh, infrastructure, social organization, strengthening the leaderships, the social leaderships uh, or uh, features, and so they can get organized and they 
take good decisions together as a community. And for the past 16 years, we found a very interesting way to include or bird, bird um, uh, concerns or the bird or bird priority, and not only bird, but also other um, threatened biodiversity and environmental services through the inclusion of high conservation values. And, and through those conservation, high conservation values, develop best management practices on forestry. So that's, that's the, the main focus we have been working now, especially in the mountains of Chiapas, where most of the um, production was based on agriculture and cattle, which is not the best way to, to, to manage the forest, of course. I, I leave it at this point, so to have thanks. more time for other people. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. Um, I'm going to call. Uh, I'm going to call next on um, Umberto, uh, and then finally on Kristen and Umberto. Thank you. Hello, Tom. Hello, everyone. You hear me well? Yes, we do. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to say that um, it has been a very interesting workshop. I, I like very much what I have heard and the concerns that are uh, raising uh, around social science co-production and the importance of communications. And, and these days I have been thinking a lot in, in how can we really innovate in, in, in the way we do business, especially in Latin America where many things are happening. And, and, and we have been discussing things like uh, if we have to go out, um, or to use the single species approach or not, we want to focus on the old bird conservation scheme. Uh, and, and, and other aspects associated to how we plan and, 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 and operate conservation programs or projects at the continental scale. And, and uh, talking with my, with my colleagues here, um, uh, we were thinking about um, how, what can be like a, a different way to approach um, these challenges, you know? Um, and I think that uh, the, the citizen science concept has um, uh, become a very important way of operation. And the platforms that we all share for, for example, monitoring birds uh, that have become very popular and, and the, the use of these platforms can become uh, a very powerful tool for engaging people in, and, 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 and gaining interest and, and commitment of the society and normal people, regular people, non-biologists, birders, and sometimes not even birders, people that is just interested in nature, that uh, by means of these type of platforms have become uh, birders or people interested in birds uh, that have many, many potentials um, and, and talents and, and abilities that we don't even consider when we plan uh, research or conservation activities because they are out of the picture. Um, so um, one important thing is, in my opinion, is to uh, find a way to involve more and more and more people at the local scale. Uh, because, I mean, different from the U.S., where I think there are 70 million birders, maybe in Mexico now are probably uh, some tens of thousands now, but that has uh, happened in the last 20 years. So uh, the, the tradition is something that is it's, it, it's something that is beginning to happen. And it's very important because uh, every day we have more people involved with this. Second, second thing, I, uh, we as, as biologists, as professionals, as conservationists, as communication people, uh, uh, we should um, find ways to, to, to share our our abilities and to and to and to um, help with capacity building and, and, and to share our, uh, new skills for them uh, related to to to, to our conservation um, in such a way that, that we um, support local leadership local leadership uh, and in the in the medium and long term uh, empowerment because we want to have an impact on the conservation of habitats as. Sarai and Nick uh, described, we need the local people 
doing the local jobs, the local work of conservation and speaking with the local authorities, with the manage, manager of the protected area and with the landowners, et cetera, et cetera. That's very important because, I mean, we are talking about here the entire continent, migratory species, charismatic, local endemics and so on. Um, in this way, we can um, move faster and in a more efficient way and having these people trained, committed, uh, involved in activities of research, for example, in the umbrella of citizen science and also um, running um, conservation actions at, at, their, at their scale, which is the local scale. And then with that, we can have like, like the entire picture at, at, at the regional level and then um, connect these two levels of operation uh, uh, to be more successful. I don't know if I was clear with what I, what I described, but um, it, it's a way to connect all the way from scientists in labs to local landowners dealing with fire or planting cacao or simply um, doing environmental education activities in their communities. It, 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 it's a way to connect all, all, the, all the different levels, in my opinion. So uh, building capacity building at the local level and empowerment for implementing conservation actions and monitoring and research. Thanks, Umberto. Um, Kristen, I'm going to give you the tough job after you describe what your work has been of uh, sort of trying to touch on some of these um, themes. How can social science help us really do some of that connecting between the sort of larger structures of government and, and then this the work at the community level? Um, if you have any insights on that, that would be great. I know that's a tough one. Thanks. And I want to thank our presenters for the rich embedded practice that they brought to us today and uh, the dedication that it's taken. And as we know, it does need to be taken. Um, I'll just pull out a couple of themes that I heard in all of your stories, but that I might focus on from a social science point of view. And that is um, working on habitat and managed lands is an, a going, is, continues to be and will always be an essential component of what, what is done. And um, so holding that strong and continuing whatever, whether it is revitalizing or creating new habitats or imagining even as habitats change how we can use those habitats and working lands is really important. The other thing that I, as a social scientist, I'm rather interested in look, studying the scientists, right? Because if they are a primary actor in this, this landscape, um, working with scientists, and you are in all of your various communities, um, and then bringing the scientists in to work with the communities. As Umberto said, we need more birders. We need more scientists also that are that are well trained and comfortable, and will take the time to work with communities, and and that and so we need to be working with our science community or as a scientist. So my primary objective is to study scientists at some level in some capacity. Um, the other thing I heard, and I've heard that in all of your talks, there were lovely examples in different spaces. One thing I know about people from being somebody who works from the individual to the policy and uh, power levels of the macro system, I like, you find your comfort space, you all have your birds that you, you all smile when, when the, you see that picture. Uh, my space is communities. So I like that group work piece, but I'll, I do all of that. And one of the things I know repeatedly over my different habitats that I've worked with is um, people are problem solvers. Is if they are given the ability to, to thrive, they're problem solvers. And we are problem solvers and so are farmers, so are foresters and communities that are trying to create a rich life are problem solvers. So, um, you know, the idea of experimenting is what happens in human society. So beginning with experiments together and not saying we're going to do it this way, this is what, you know, this is what 
pro-production is and you know, you know, we'll read our list of what to do, but just start doing that together and study that doing, study what that doing is, or that's what a social scientist, you can do it or your help doing that. So I've done that type of experiment and we compare different ways of working and how it, how it works. So then I heard you all speak to that, the doing, but then the study, the doing as, as well as you study the population or you know, the relationships of a uh, habitat to a population. The other thing that I heard you all say that I, that I really resonated was um, thinking about the relationships. And most uh, ecology very much understands models, relationships, social science does too. Sometimes we forget about focusing on those relationships with different theoretical constructs out of social science, such as social network analysis. You may have done some of that, but there are many others of, of that nature that can help you look at power and uh, values and you know, resources or whatever attribute you're thinking about. And so I find that as early on doing that rather than later as, as really critical. Um, the other thing that I wonder about, and I would like, this is more probing you for some conversation, is, you know, you described so many years of work, I'm thinking of what would you recommend in terms of, would you form a new team and train that team through experimentation to do things? How, you know, I, I'm inclined to say that's where you're gonna have your richest start as opposed to, and so I, I ask you guys, did, did you start from scratch with new teams and young scholars or you know, how did you work through that scientist team that's gonna to stick together and keep building? So Nick, you mentioned you know, masters and you know, really working with graduate students. The other piece is roles. So the work we did um, in, in Chiapas related to forestry and all sorts of production systems, aquaculture, um, looking at the role that the community member plays, and especially in indigenous communities, you probably already have indigenous representatives from the community presenting at your national meetings. You've probably already gotten that far, but moving to that point where they are not only local, but they're so young, usually it's a young member of the community, not the elders of the community, but you know, working in that direction um, so that all roles are played by all folks, right? Because often scientists get into a certain role. And, um, and so back to my relationships as the, the key piece is uh, a question for you is how did you make the translation to just reinforce those relationships, maybe by being in an NGO and not in a university, because the, the amount of time it takes to build relations and dedication, you do not, you, you are in community, you're working with community over time. And so, you know, what happens when your department head says, we want four more pubs out of, you know, those of you who are in academics. And then I'm gonna, maybe others could speak to this. My last piece would be, and I do not need to hijack the situation because we are all in this, situ this case, but, Let's look at the macro system of economy. So, so you, you mentioned from climate change, but at the macro system level, the drivers of a lot of the systems you're talking about have to do with a political economy uh, uh, that is, is pushing a type of production. And so if we at least acknowledge it or how, how do we need to always keep that on the horizon? Um, it, because I think we, if I, Tom knows better, but I think the goal is actually recovery of in all endangered species, right? Well, if that, then we need a macro level critique of how production is happening and who gets benefits out of production. So I know I'll step back from that and just thank you all for the work you are doing and will continue to do, we hope. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks for asking 30 more questions. 
I hardly know where to begin, but clearly the the theme of working with communities has been really central in this in this discussion. And I'm just kind of curious, um, just for myself, or thinking about that relationship building, and you know, what for any of you have been, you know, what just jumped out at you when you realized, well, I did this, and this really worked. This really this really brought me into the community. What did I do? That's one question, and the other one is. You know, I mean, we talk about co-production and sometimes we don't talk about, understand that co-production is the co-production of knowledge. To what extent, for example, Nick, when you um, work with the communities that you work with, to what extent are those those local folks involved in actually deciding what the research question is and how that research might be conducted? Or, or is it just a protocol that we deliver to them? Whether that protocol that we deliver be um, a monitoring protocol, or maybe it's a, a land management or best management practice protocol to a producer. Um, to what extent do we can we involve the the local leaders in actually making some of those important decisions? I mentioned your name, Nick, so you can take it first, and then maybe Sari could. Okay. Yeah. So I <clears throat> I would certainly say from my career and, and many people I've worked with that often we're guilty of not involving the individuals who are going to be working, whether they're from communities or the local biologists, in those early decisions in terms of, you know, what exactly are we going to do in a study? Um, I think what we do a good job of is, is when we're working with them that they feel an integral part of the team and they can comment on what we're doing. And and really drive where some of that research goes after those first stages. Um, but I still think there's a lot of room to be thinking about making sure that, yeah, we're asking those questions of the people or of the communities we're gonna work with right from the start. So we may have a specific research question, but why not ask the communities, what do you want to get out of this as well? And see if we can intertwine those different needs to, to create a product that's actually gonna be more useful for all of us. Um, and I think, you know, one of these really interesting examples that just comes up again and again, certainly in the work we're doing is, is tree species, for example. So one thing we wanna know, if we're doing restoration, what tree species can we plant that are gonna maximize food for bird, resources for birds and use by birds? But at the same time, communities, they're not against tree planting trees. And in fact, they often want to know which trees can I plant, plant along this stream that runs from my farm to maximize the water production, which I can use for irrigating my crops or what it happens to be, or which tree species are actually gonna attract birds that are gonna control the predators that are attacking my coffee crop. So, you know, if right from the start, rather than framing the questions only around birds, but actually framing them around these immediate ecosystem service needs that many, communities and farmers have, I think, you know, we can have a much richer and broader research experience. Thanks, Nick. You know, I'm looking at the clock and I'm, unfortunately <laughs> there's a, there's now 80 questions to ask. Um, um, I'm, a, I'm afraid we'll have to end this session and, and, and turn it back over to Paul. But before we do, I, I would just want to Turn it over to Edwin. And Edwin, um, if I were to ask you what what final message do you want the participants to uh, of the of the the attendees of the workshop to get out of this session, what would that be? Thank you, Tom, and thank you to other panelists uh, for this great discussion. Although it feels very brief for other rich topics that have been brought up, but I think it provides a really solid um, um, uh, taste for what a future workshop of two or three days would look like that really brings all those uh, topics to a rich and fuller discussion. But I think this is a really great introduction to that. Uh, and I think one of the things that I think we can think about is that um, learning about how international partners implement conservation in these different uh, geographies and these different uh, realities in Canada, Colombia, and Mexico can help us identify ways um, uh, this full life cycle species working groups or initiatives can, you know, we can think about expanding our strategic planning to include some of these 
elements that have been identified that go beyond birds. And that's thinking about community needs, uh, community, community uh, e local economies, empowering uh, um, communities such as the women that uh, Sarai Contreras talked about in Jalisco, also building the, the local capacity such as in Colombia that uh, Nick mentioned. Also, another example that comes to mind is the Programa de Aves Urbanas in Mexico that has been really been a driver in empowering local birders and expanding the pool of um, people engaged in bird watching. And that's something that I'm working with a little bit in El Salvador through the local biologists there. And also really thinking about how this non-bird elements as I think as I think about them, we in the bird community can start really thinking about them in a more serious and comprehensive way. And there's other initiatives, you know, that um, that are really addressing some of this non-bird needs or have the mechanisms or the fr frameworks in place, you know, such as maybe biodiversity goals from the UN or climate change goals that our country may have. And to me, is how can we work with those other mechanisms to kind of bring the bird piece element into more focus so that when our partners on the ground are looking for different tools and bringing, you know, incorporating biodiversity goals, incorporating watershed needs for the communities, they can also more readily integrate bird element, which is, um, you know, that will lead obviously to species recovery. So that was kind of my kind of take home message. Great wrap up. Thanks, Edwin, so much. So once again, I, I hope we all can come back together again with much more time available to discuss the many ideas that came out of this session. Um, presently, though, I'm going to turn the show back over to Paul, and Paul will introduce the speaker for the rest of the morning session. Um, so, Paul, you're on. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all the, the presenters and panelists this morning. We could have spent a couple of days on, on this, these to international topics, um, uh, but uh, well, time is always limited, right? Uh, now it's my uh, uh, real pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, it's a plenary speak, and Dr. Drew Lanham is a native of Edgefield, South Carolina. He's a product of a family farm with abundant wildness and bittersweet legacy of land interdependence by chain and choice. He's an alumna, alumni distinguished professor, provost professor and master teacher of wildlife ecology at Clemson University. Drew's work as a cultural and conservation ornithologist addresses the confluences of race, place and nature. In addition to a well-respected body of scientific work, He's a poet laureate for, from his home county and an award-winning author. Drew is a lifelong bird watcher, past board member of the Nat National Audubon Society, American Bird Association, Bird Note, and the Aldo Leopold Foundation. His writing and public discourse on birding and ethnicity have engendered wide-ranging discussions about the expanded roles of engagement, inclusion, equity, diversity in wildlife conservation. It's my pleasure to introduce Drew Lanham. Drew? Thank you so much, Paul. And, and thank you to everyone out there who's attended for this workshop for the past three days. As, as has been indicated, we could spend a lot of time talking about any one of these species that we have as, as priorities for recovery. But I think we could spend even more time talking about the human element. I always tell my students that really the, the species that we are trying to recover, those non-human species, the science in some ways is much easier than the ordeal of managing Homo sapiens sapiens. And so with that in mind, I'd like to give in my time a little bit of a, of a different um, plenary, um, a little bit of a, a funneling down to some of what we have heard for the past three days. And I will share my three decades of what I call bird adoring work, um, because I, I think that that progression or at least that 
um, that move, that migration from academic through these other through these other realms lends to our whole idea of co-production. So this will be an introspective of triangulation, if you will, of three decades of bird adoring work. Next slide, please. So you'll, you'll see um, this presentation. Um, I've presented portions of it as range mapping, blurring the lines of sustainable coexistence between birds and people. And so um, that's really too long to be a proper subtitle, but it is an alternative, alternative title that I like to have people understand um, really at the core of it is beginning to think about convergence, blurring these lines between birds and people. Next slide, please. So what's the triangulation? And as we talked about co-production, certainly at the beginning of my career in 1995 as faculty, and before that as a graduate student, hadn't heard of it. Um, I don't think it had been, um, had been invented. Certainly we had talked about elements of co-production. Maybe we use different terminology to describe it. But my 26 years as an academic doing what academics do in terms of teaching research and outreach at a land grant institution, um, I think required me to engage in this, this multiplicity of partnerships across the spectrum of, of supporters and collaborators, um, stakeholders, all of those entities interested in, in, in wildlife and birds in particular. A step I think maybe to either side of academia was this um, in the process of, of doing all this work with these partners, having the chance to move beyond writing about birds in scientific journals um, to begin to think about advocacy. And one of the things that I, I, I don't do for my students is that I really try to bring in this idea that conservation really does not exist without advocacy. So these conservation boards that I served on that you heard about in the introduction from Paul, the two state, the four national um, organizations, more than 50 years of service with them, chairing some leading efforts for inclusion, diversity and engagement and expansions of, of, of these old paradigms beyond the traditions on which many of the organizations were founded, gave me a different sort of standing beyond my academic standing. This advocacy on these conservation boards um, is, is really another lesson in how conservation gets done or how it gets stalled, to be honest about it. And so that's the second point of the triangulation that I'll bring in today. And then finally, activism, because I think even though that's an uncomfortable word for many today in our field, I mean, after all, many of us were we're sort, of, um, we're sort of brought in to understand that activism and advocacy aren't part of what we do. Um, I beg to differ. Um, I beg to, 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 to differ in that um, this rigorous science that we do as researchers, as academics, as, as managers, as stewards, really goes no further than the, the, the choir room, as it were, if we don't become advocates for the resource and, and I would argue activists. So my role as an ethno-ornithologist, as it were, um, I teach critical race theory. And so I have to face that in the classrooms. Now people can argue about the components of what that means, but I can connect it to ornithology very easily. All I have to do is go into the, 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 er, the earlier annals of ornithology where Negroes were um, listed alongside mesomammalian predators as primary factors in decline of bob white quail in the Southeast, or to go to the name for double-crested cormorants, nigger geese that still exist in duck blinds today. So in doing that, I can bring in these elements of of bias, of, of how we think about race and nature. And I do that through this nonfiction nature writing. I do it as a public speaker. And 
because I'm a Southern a Black American male, um, there are issues that I have to address, not just personally, but societally. So conservation does not mean being satisfied with the status quo. Um, conservation is, is really um, this intense care that we must have for the resource and um, selflessly so. So next slide, please. So what I, I attempt to do in presentations, and you'll hear me use this word occasionally, is to build empathy and a warning. Um, many of the species that you will see are not um, on the road to recovery um, scheme. Um, I think all species ultimately will get there because we need to know where common birds are as well as those birds are, that are threatened. But in thinking about um, warbler species that many people are attracted to, um, in describing the sort of ubiquitous generalist nature of a yellow warbler versus the specialized restricted uh, range uh, habitat uh, and behavior and range of a Swainson's warbler versus um, the, the formerly endangered status of Kirtland's warbler and being unable to, to almost pinpoint range on a map from a long distance to ask people to think about sort of the privilege of equity and, 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 and general, um, this generalist ecology versus the sort of um, on the edge existence of a Swainson's warbler um, restricted to certain habitats um, and, and within those habitats, relatively narrow niches, but then to um, a Kirtland's warbler that exists in such small numbers that at any given time, it, it could thankfully not as, as, um, as problematic now, but could tip off the scale of existence. So that's a way in a quick ornithology lesson with three warblers that are easily recognizable to bring people into this point of thinking, hey, you know, what's the difference between these birds and how these birds exist and how we might go about conserving them? Next slide, please. We could just as easily do this, of course, with, with rusty blackbirds, this, this flock of birds that, um, that I am sort of used to encountering here um, in, a, in one of my local birding patches, but we can certainly take the species that we've been discussing for the last uh, couple of days and, and think of them in this scheme and begin by thinking about the bird's ecology to move that ecology beyond the birds to human beings. Next slide, please. And so the human experience, what are the factors that limit or expand our ranges? This then moves into that realm, I suppose, of human dimensions. Now I need to qualify my presentation and myself by saying I am not a human dimension specialist, even though for the first portion of my career, because human dimensions was really winnowed down um, um, often to issues of, of folks who they did not think or others might not think traditionally belonged sort of in the, the, the old guard. Many folks thought as a black wildlife biologist that that was my specialty and it's not. Um, I am not trained in it other than the experience of, of, of living in a different skin than most ornithologists, but also being exposed to how the convergence of ecologies bird ecologies and human ecologies are re really inextricably linked. Next slide, please. So we can talk about with human beings, habitat suitability, whether we are urban or rural or ex-urban and how those things are changing. We can talk about foraging opportunities and food deserts and the lack of, 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 of foods, of sustainable, whole foods within a land of abundance and what that creates in terms of human existence. Next slide, please. This is an old map, but we can certainly talk about maps that, that more based upon politics, based upon the decisions of nine individuals sitting on a bench 
we can talk about mate selection. We can talk about predation risk um, and, and where we choose to live and what expands our range or what perhaps contracts that same range. Next slide. But ultimately, it all comes down for us and birds to our lives, to our survivability. I would also move that to what I call thriveability. Um, and, and here in the United States, we, we talk about um, the pursuit of, of, of happiness, life and liberty and, and those things. But then how do those factors, habitat suitability, whether we are redlined or not, whether we can get whole foods or not, whether we can be with whom we choose to be or not, and whether we can be safe in all of those things, those are certainly parallels that we think about when we are modeling mortality and persistence for any bird species. Those factors go into those models. I would argue that we need to place those factors within the layers that we consider when we're thinking about not just ourselves, but how we will conserve birds going forward. Next slide, please. So another factor that I like to bring to light is behavior. Next slide. So um, in, in, in a bit of, of levity, I always present this um, to help people understand that, that our behavior is constantly being mapped, just as we might might map the behavior, um, the, the phenology, for example, of nesting, chronology of nesting of, of species from the south to north, or maybe how behavior is changing um, in choice of, of nesting sites, um, those kinds of things we can map. Human behavior is constantly being mapped. Those little discount slips that we get after we buy something at the local drugstore help determine which of the seven deadly sins, for example, our region is most likely to engage in. Next slide, please. But then going a little more seriously, how we communicate and how that looks on a map. So this, this floating sheep um, research that's been done out of Humboldt State University for quite some while gives us an idea for example, of how we sing. That is how our voices through social media are magnified. In these cases, showing homophobic hate and racist hate. Next slide, please. And so the total amount of tweets giving us some idea of the geography of hate, um, we can pull back and, and begin to look at data. And I said initially in this triangulation of of, of co-production and thinking about it, I can tell you about that these kinds of maps that dictate where people may or may not be accepting of difference has an effect, a chilling effect on how we do our work. I can tell you personally that it resulted in my abandonment of my first funded research project in Western North Carolina because there were um, groups um, white nationalist groups that were um, being established in an area where I was going to look at large scale effects of forest management on neotropical migrants um, in, the, in the early to mid 1990s. I abandoned that project in part, large part, because I did not feel safe in the area and so removed myself and designed another project. Those stories can be told over and over again, not just through the lens of ethnicity or race, but also likely um, through gender, non-gender um, choice, but also through other factors that we need to pay attention to. Next slide, please. And so these eco-socio-psychological impacts, next, next slide. are the collage, I would call, of conundrums, the collage of considerations that we must consider in addition to the bird range maps that we look at. Any management decisions that we are making, 
those decisions that we consider making bird ecology um, management and, and stewardship sorts of decisions, again, are sometimes I would call relatively cut and dry. Sure, there's a lot that we don't know about rusty blackbirds, a ton that we don't know about black rails. But then we have to consider within the context of the management that we do, what larger society is being impacted with. And so these might seem like issues outside of the purview of our our, our, our road to recovery considerations, but I hope to show you in a few moments some examples of how they come to bear immediately upon how we might move forward as conservationists to make what our work is more holistic. Next slide, please. And so we all saw this on January 6th. It chilled some of us probably more than others. But again, this is a symbol for me that I've had to deal with in my research in remote sites on breeding bird survey routes. And how am I to listen for that Blackburnian warbler or to hear whether or not that trill or rattle is wormy or chipping sparrow. All of these come into play as an ornithologist and things that we take for granted, relatively easy identification tasks for most of us. But when we have to have a third eye trained on something other than the birds or the habitat, or another ear to listen to whether the engine noise slows so that I have to be careful and maybe cut my time at that point short. All of those are considerations that we have to think about. And especially, I would argue, when we're talking to younger professionals, when we're talking to graduate students, as we think about how we become more inclusive in our work, how do we deal with symbols and monuments and political attitude. Next slide, please. And so here is a typical map that I would present as range overlap. What you see below, you see trans -bulk migrants and breeders in some places like scarlet tanagers and Blackburnian warblers here in South Carolina in the Ace Basin, certainly for painted buntings and swallowtail kites and um, winter residents, relatively small winter resident populations of red knots, but certainly important stopover habitats for birds that Felicia Sanders now knows don't go up the eastern seaboard, but birds that take off straight over the southern Appalachians for the Arctic. And so that South Carolina low country that you see highlighted here along with the rest of the southeast, these aren't these, these splotches aren't the ranges of birds, but concentrations of black people. And so showing here this range overlap between a, a human demographic and birds and understanding that we have to consider these layers of people and their conditions alongside the conditions of the birds. Elsewise, again, we're talking at that first A that I described. We're talking frequently to the, the same choir of peers who review, who do the important, the critical peer review of our science. Um, but then how do we, we move that science beyond that choir room into an advocacy position and then sometimes into an activist position where things have to get done? Next slide, please. So an example here, again, a bird that, that we, we aren't talking about on the road to recovery, but one that shares correlates of, of habitat association, I think that are important, and certainly from a geographic um, position are, are critical 
for us to think about um, because there are species like red cockaded woodpecker, for example, and black rail that share um, these, these positions on the map with swallowtail kites. Here you see them represented with two maps. One is the South Carolina Breeding Bird Atlas, which has not been updated for a while. And so these numbers um, or these, these ranges that you see would change um, pretty dramatically. But the inset map that you see of South Carolina Crescent counties are those poor counties along the I-95 corridor that really exist in third world condition. Next slide, please. But in those Crescent counties, in particular in Allendale and Barnwell counties, there are these, these open fields where um, swallowtailed and Mississippi kites gather um, primarily during post breeding and in these, in these, uh, these flocked foraging activities where hatches of, of grasshoppers and, and this uh, year probably cicadas, dragonflies, um, provide abundant prey for them both. And so here you see a center pivot irrigation field um, with, with more swallowtailed and Mississippi kites than many people might see in a lifetime unless they go to some of these places where these birds congregate in the Southeast. You see here in the state uh, newspaper inset, Swallowtailed Kites Air Show draws bird watchers and photographers to Allendale. Next slide, please. But keep in mind that Allendale is one of the poorest counties in America. Now you see this is, yes, this is a 10 year old newspaper clipping, but the, the, the status for Allendale hasn't changed appreciably. It's still one of the poorest, if not the poorest county in South Carolina, which then ranks it highly or lowly considering where, how you want to rank your scale on poor counties, the, 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 the earnings per household are lower than most of us might carry around our necks in binoculars, long lenses, spotting scopes, and tripods. And so when we think about the richness of Allendale County for something like swallowtailed kites, are we also thinking about the economic conditions um, of, the, of, the, of the people, um, maybe whose fields we are watching some of these birds over? Next slide, please. And so I like to, to bring this convergence. So in, in going from, again, this, this academic position of being able to talk about swallowtail kites and sort of this biphasic habitat requirement of bottomland hardwood swamps versus um, these, these uh, agricultural areas, old fields. But talk about that, but to, to, to talk in the South Carolina low country, particularly about black rails, to talk about black ducks as I have students and, and, and bird watching groups out in these places, looking for these birds, hoping for these birds to understand that there is a history underneath the Spartina, that there is credit to be given to the state agencies, the federal agencies that are in part stewards of these habitats, but to understand that these habitats were indeed created hundreds of thousands of acres created by enslaved black people. And so, that is not necessarily what people may come on a bird walk for initially. But again, for me, it, it begins to become a kind of co-production, this sharing of vision um, for people to, to, to gain knowledge, but for me to also understand how they feel about the landscape. This is especially important if I'm dealing with a diverse group of students or birders um, to understand where the empathy lies, perhaps, in people who have, may have had ancestors that participated in creating this habitat, or perhaps indigenous ancestors who were moved away from the habitat um, before it was deforested. And so understanding those kinds of exchanges, I think, are as much a part of co-production 
as we might do um, as stewards and professionals thinking about habitat models and thinking about how we proceed on the road to recovery for these birds. Next slide, please. And so again, just to show the multiplicity of species, wood storks, black rails, painted bunting, backman sparrows, red cockaded woodpeckers that Jeff Walters has talked so much about that I've had the opportunity to work with Ralph Costa on a good bit, and swallowtail kites, all of these birds that share ranges within the context of, of third world condition, especially for many Black people. Next slide, please. And we can repeat the overlap, of course, for the Southwest in talking about aplomato falcons or red-faced warblers or elegant trogons or South Florida and roseate spoonbills in terms of Latin X dem demographic and what's going on there. And of course, as we talked earlier this morning, many of these birds we share borders with. The birds don't recognize political borders. So how do we deal with human condition? Again, go back to the collage and the wall. And I can tell you in, in working bird festivals down in South Texas, it's always amazing when, when we take birders to the wall to go to Southmost Preserve on the other side of it and, and people don't understand what the wall is. And that the primary question for many of them becomes, can I count the birds on the other side of the wall? Next slide, please. So we have to begin to think, as, as, we've, as has been mentioned this morning, outside of the box. I like to say for those of us who are so enthralled with, with birds, our, our metaphor perhaps becomes taking our binoculars down to see a wider field of view. So water matters matter for birds and for us. Next slide, please. And I like to mention that. Um, because you see this, this dearth of outcry from environmental um, and bird conservation organizations when questions of clean water come up in Flint, Michigan, or Memphis, or Jackson, uh, Mississippi, or in Barnwell, South Carolina. And so those are conditions um, that we have to think about. We have to think about predation risks, some of us, from the police. We have to think about whether our graduate students or we ourselves are going to need to carry sidearms or perhaps how, are we, how do we deal with that first graduate student who says, who, who may walk into our building with a sidearm and says, I feel safer with this when I'm out in the field than without. Next question, please, or next slide, thank you. So we have to deal with the political realities. We have to think about the maps of blue versus red and how they integrate with green. Ultimately, we will have to cross the aisle to get work done. That's ultimately what co-production is. It's for me, at least in my mind, it's crossing these, uh, these aisles of ideals and understanding how we come together, not just in the science, but also in the sociology and the psychology of what conservation indeed means to people who may not have the same values that we hold. Next slide, please. And so some considerations here, um, and you'll see these slides repeat a little bit, but I wanted to add in some of what, at least there's so much that I've learned this week in these three days that have enlightened um, me and, and how I am thinking about co-production, but also maybe to give, to offer some questions of my own. So conservation implementation hinges on attitude and action. That's advocacy, that's activism in my mind. Thinking of sustaining and growing the successes of the conservation community have to be intentional. And they have to be intentional in this idea of thinking what, about what conservation and environmentalism actually are. Um, if you're in the classroom at all, you'll understand that if you ask the question of students on that first day in any class in a wildlife or forestry or an environmental oriented major, how many of you are conservationists? How many of you are environmentalists? And you will often get two different pools of students that break down by some 
some some demographics, but then to understand how we bring those students together across that chasm. I think this gap that also exists out there in the conservation world between organizations. Okay, so how much does Ducks Unlimited, for example, talk to the American Birding Association or what are the partnerships between groups that would see themselves differently, but in fact have in common birds and the well being of those birds. So it's about widening the audience in many ways, concerned with the environment and with conservation. That's engagement, that's inclusion, but I also see that as a critical component of co production that we have to do at the academic level, but then as advocates and activists as well. Next, next slide, please. So again, you see these same headers, but I have in red just for, from yesterday, really, um, some of the ideas that, that popped out. Neil Clipperton's um, statement of saying that we must seek out those willing to go and make a difference. That's activism. <laughs> um, conservation doesn't mean conservative. It doesn't mean that things stay the same. Amber Roth's statement in saying that we need to invest as much in the people as the birds. This is how we sustain and grow the success of the conservation community. I know that many, if not most of us, got into this business not because we were people people, because we termed ourselves as introverts and that we wanted to be out in the wild world away from people. Well, the breaking news is that we can't do this work without considering humanity's well-being. And so we all have to become in some sort of way human dimensions workers. And I think Amber brought that out. Seeking data from local hunters regarding shorebird harvest, Jim Johnson's wonderful presentation on lesser yellow legs and, and, and how these the slow slog that it can be to learn what's going on the ground on on the ground. Now, back in the old days at a land grant institution, we call this extension. But extension, unfortunately, has experienced extinction in many places. And so programmatically widening the audience, one of those considerations means means lobbying for more extension, lobbying for more outreach. And in the work that I'm doing with the waterfowl fo folks, for example, it means teaching the students that we want to send south into Mexico and Central America to work as waterfowl interns. We need to mix in a Spanish language class or four so that our students are as equipped to go there, or perhaps if they're going into French Canada, that we can no longer simply silo our students in the tradition of how they've always been taught. And so in, in thinking of this and considering the well-being, Christian Hagen's examples of how he's worked with private landowners, with, with those people who sit on the overwhelming swath of land that lesser prairie chickens need, that there have to be conservation conversations across fences, literally and figuratively, that there has to be time, perhaps, for a swig or two of famous grouse. Next, question, next slide, please. And then finally, checking and rechecking range map overlap. After all, this is sort of what I'm presenting in this presentation. Kelly Van Beek's comments on on what I call de-siloing and asking um, the question of, of, of how we move outside of sort of current conservation paradigm. And so I would ask, are we prepared to, to upend some traditions, to change the worn out paradigms? Are we prepared to reconfigure the impact processes and see conservation more broadly than, than it occurs um, presently. And, and so this is about us taking the binoculars down and seeing a wider field of view. I don't know of any binocular, I don't care how much you pay for super premium, that can see as broadly as you can when you take those binoculars down 
and you don't just see where the bird is at eight power, but you see where everything is around it at the power of human and land condition. Next slide, please. And so there are a few questions here. I want you to consider is co-production being practiced at all levels of integration. So in, in, in my 30 plus years of doing this, um, I've seen a lot. I've seen where it falls short in academia um, because it's siloed frequently into sort of these compartments of, 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 of really almost private enterprise, um, where it falls short at, at nonprofits and NGOs because of competition for membership, for example. Um, within federal and state organizations. Again, are we thinking beyond our established ranges? Can we connect, for example, golden wing warbler well-being to black residents in North Carolina who are downwind of pellet mills and 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 the biomass um, and, and the biomass movement in forestry? So I'm initiating work with with a community trauma specialist, a nurse, in fact, and new wildlife biologists on the Cherokee National Forest to begin to, to think about these communities that may be far removed from golden winged warbler shrub scrub, but are being impacted by the pellets that are produced in that habitat creation. So we have to think about issues like, um, like, like, like forest stewardship. We have to think about um, sustainability and, and, and reworking forest certification, both through FSC and, 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 through, um, and, through the, uh, and through SFI. We have to, to ask if indigenous nations and communities are at the decision maker table and stakeholder table, that they're not just being considered or asked after the fact, but are there from the very beginning, being asked um, what their desires and viewpoints are. How do we overcome past perceptions to forge more co-productive pathways? So again, for example, um, with, with some of the problematic issues that ornithology has had um, in terms of, 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 of racism, of bias, of misogyny, um, both historically and present, um, some, of, some of those issues that we know exist, how do we overcome those to move forward? We have to think about expanding into the unknown. So for example, um, I think about Rusty Blackbird concentration here in South Carolina, and I think about it at Lake Conistee, that's a brown field. And I think about those birds in the pecan groves where pecans are crushed, um, where those nut meats are readily available for those birds, but they are in impoverished white communities, what I call rabble belt, formerly um, cotton mill communities. And so how do we think about all of these issues? Ken's statement of in-reach versus outreach, I think is critical. I hope you all caught that. That introspection is a critical component of the work that we do. That's our mission. Next slide, please. And so this is, this is a pledge to work for nature. Um, I, as a creative writer, I spend a lot of time thinking, again, sort of outside of the box of science, but then always trying to come back into, um, into the science and, and, and thinking about how we might take the data that we gather as ornithologists, as ecologists, as any kind of scientist that we are, to ultimately move forward. And so this pledge to work for nature, sharing same air, same water, same soil, same earth, and ultimately the same fate, that birds, humans, and every other living thing, that we, that we, we share first the knowledge, we seek first the knowledge of rigorous objective science, and then the ongoing counsel of all stakeholders is our charge. Conservation must engender care beyond self or selfish motive to consider future generations beyond us. Considerations of better for birds, humanity, and our shared condition that are inextricably linked is more than worthy work. It is mission that we work to right the wrongs against nature and humankind is moral obligation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
And so we know that there are issues. I know that there was a point in time that I was not going to go winter birding at Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. And I still have to have considerations for the demographic that might be there and how they might feel about me or students who have certain political affiliations or who may not feel comfortable in certain landscapes. Next slide, please. But we see how stressors and questions about who we are as a field, and I'll call us a community, a community of professionals, a community of volunteers, a community of, of, of hobbyists. And so just in the last couple of days published in, um, in North Carolina, Black Birders harnessing social media to push for field safety, the consideration of Black Birders Week and what that brought to light in light um, in the same week or the same month of Christian Cooper's assault in Central Park. Next slide, please. And so I think about success stories. I mentioned Allendale earlier, and there is an Allendale Swallowtailed Kite Festival or Allendale Kite Festival because Mississippi kites are pretty cool too. Um, but in attending that first festival a couple of years ago to encounter, to encounter Black women from Allendale, the Arts Commission, as it were, who were there, who um, were thinking about swallowtail kites in ways, but had never experienced swallowtailed kites. They had read about them. They had read the science. Um, they were advocates for art and nature in Allendale, but the activist activity was going out to see those swallowtail kites. And here you see them enjoying, by my count that day, there were 22 swallowtailed kites and close to 60 Mississippi kites. Next slide, please. And you see here the evidence of what that day of activism did. This is a consideration for the logo for the Allendale Arts Council. And so here you have these half dozen black women out watching birds, beginning to think about how you leverage nature for the better of the community as a whole. That to me is co-production in action. Next slide, please. Here, um, a slide that I love showing that's getting older because it's been a while since Snowy Owls um, put on a show like they did in 2013. But here you see my good friend Carrie Samus in the midst of, um, uh, and me and, and, and in the midst of uh, a crowd of black and brown young people who many of whom um, live in impoverished conditions on the Eastern shore of Maryland had never made trips to Assateague and the other wonderful places around until Carrie um, really began to move out of the role that she had at a, at a local NGO, at a regional NGO to engage black and brown children um, or young people and not in ways um, that were menial, for example, picking up trash or doing um, heavy labor unless that labor was helping to ban turns or pelicans, or doing waiter counts. And on this day, seeing five snowy owls um, on, on Assateague that expanded their range beyond Berlin, Maryland, beyond the Eastern shore to the Arctic, to begin to ask questions about why the birds were there, that we could answer basic questions of ecology, but then also begin to ponder perhaps questions of climate change and how it's affecting not just the Arctic, but at home. So it was a question that day or a phenomenon that day rather of thinking globally and acting locally colliding with those five snowy owls. The inset is of me with a group of students from primarily from historically black colleges and universities at Beidler Swamp where you can see more prothonotary warblers, more, more golden swamp warblers in a day again than many people will see in multiple years. But to get these young people out into this, this forest primeval, 
with 1,200, 1,400 year old trees to not only talk about birds, but to talk about that swamp as a refuge for runaway and escaped enslaved for the Maroons who used this wildness as refuge before anyone thought about it as wildlife refuge. Next slide, please. And so finally, I like to present this because it's most current and we, we had a wonderful presentation on black rails. I encourage you to go to the Post and Court Courier and look at this wonderful article, um, this feature by Tony Bartolome because the page you see Ghost Bird is animated. Um, it's actually footage of a black rail. Yes, the only black rail that many of us will ever see for as many kiki coos, kiki durs that we hear um, to, to see this bird animated, but then to see the story, uh, the heroic story really of a state biologist, Christy Hand, and the work that she does there, the work that Bo Bauer does at Nemours Wildlife Foundation. Um, and then um, for me to have the honor of talking about the convergence of, of, of black rail ecology, of the, the history um, in the South Carolina Low Country and how those converge, for example, around Harriet Tubman is an incredible opportunity at co-producing, I think, in some different ways. Next slide, please. So I love to finish with this because these are, are three seemingly, or at least um, two kind of disparate images but I point to Silent Spring for its influence that it had. And here is a, a woman who is making the difference, who is the, 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 the founder really, as it were, of the environmental movement. And maybe us thinking about birds as, as these canaries in the coal mine that we knew they were, but for Rachel Carson to have the courage um, in the face of, of, of so much of what she did face um, during that time, both personally but also societally. But then to go to Marvin Gaye and the album, What's Going On and the song, The Ecology, that those lyrics are still applicable today stuns many people. But all of this I think is related to our road to recovery, that by thinking outside of, of, of old paradigm, that, that bringing what's been good in our work forward but also acknowledging what hasn't, that we're exchanging these ideas, that we're exchanging vision and mission and expectation, that all of those things are being co-produced in a most positive way. Next slide, please. So there's some of my contact information. I'm, I'm not too hard to find. Um, but I would love to, to hear from you and your ideas about the presentation. And, but also I'm looking forward to meeting many of you who I don't know um, and understanding the work that you do. Next slide, please. Thought I would end with that um, because if you look closely, yeah, there are some rusty blackbirds in that flock but this is what we all work for. So I'm grateful to Paul. I'm great, grateful to, to, to Ken. I'm grateful to the organizing committee for letting me be a part. And I look forward to exchanges going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Drew. Really appreciate that terrific and uh, thought provoking presentation. So I'm looking at our time. I'm gonna pose a couple of questions and I, I don't know if our Zoom will just uh, collapse on us or not, we'll just see. Um, it may, uh, and if that's so, we'll pick up at two o'clock uh, Eastern time for the next session. But let me ask you a couple of quick questions, uh, Drew, that, that came into my head. And, and by the way, I should focus your uh, eyes eventually on the chat or the questions and answers because there's a question or two in there that is very, you know, about black rails and and you might be able to, to kind of type an answer in there. But what I'm interested in as coming from a, a career in a couple of organizations, how you balance this need for uh, advocacy and indeed activism with the constraints of, of an organization. 
and and um, I I definitely appreciate the need to move the needle in those on, on those two A's, if you will, activism and advocacy. But how do you how do you balance the challenge of the organizational constraints that are there? Great, great question, Paul. And I, I'm sort of privileged in being an academic um, and, and being able to stretch those bounds, understanding now, understanding sometimes organizationally, we know that four years prior, there were certain words that, that federal employees, for example, almost could not say. And so those constraints can change, those bounds can change with, with political whim. And so I think uh, for, for in that case, Paul, we have to make we have to make hay outside of nesting season while the sun shines, right? And and so when the opportunity arises, for example, to move policy forward, um, to to speak out more freely, that opportunity has to be taken. And I think um, I know the constraints that my friends who work for state and federal agencies operate under. But what I depend on them often for, so for example, from a federal standpoint, the funding that goes into the science, much of the science that I do, um, that I make sure that I'm doing the best science that I can do, um, that I make sure, for example, that within the confines of that science, that I'm hiring a diverse workforce, that I'm hiring students that are bringing, um, bringing more than just the ability to count births. And so that's a way of leveraging, right? So there's this quiet leveraging that we can do that's activism. And it's all legal, <laughs> you know, and it's, what we, and it's what we should be doing. So I like to think about quiet leveraging as part of it, but I recognize my privilege as an academic um, to do it. And, and what's more, I recognize my privilege as a tenured academic to do it. So there is a whole nother kettle of fish there. Quiet leveraging, that's a, great, that's a great term. Never heard that, that's awesome. Uh, another quick question from, from uh, me is, I'm really, uh, in the world of bird conservation, we have limited resources, limited time, you know, we're running out of time in a sense. And so in my mind, efficiency is really important. And mm -hmm. I've always wondered in, in my 40 years, you know, how much time to spend and donate, uh, dedicate to working to connect people with nature versus meeting them where their interests and their needs are. So if you catch what I, where I'm going with that question, yeah. I mean, it, it's a matter of where we invest. Yeah, what Paul, I, you know, here, here's an example, I think, if I can, and I'm gonna go to my ichthyologist friends because if we take a look at what's going on in fisheries and how they are approaching conservation and, and some of what's going on with inclusion and diversity there, they're way ahead of us, way ahead. And I use this example, um, you know, fishing for, for me growing up, I had never heard of catch and release unless it was in a pan of grease, <laughs> right? And, but, but now fishing has come to this point where we really think about it more as sport than subsistence. And, and so uh, people often ask me the question, how do we get more, more black folks, for example, outside? I said, well, I, black folks are outside doing lots of outdoorsy things. Um, but uh, you know, do, we, do we consider subsistence when we're thinking about slot limit? You know, and that's a, that's a question that has to come up. So, I know, for example, in the conversations about shorebird har or bird harvest in Alaska or shorebird harvest um, in Central America, there weren't, yeah, there are gonna be outcries from people here, perhaps in the US that say, you should not kill those birds. But one of the things that I was listening closely to in those presentations where there were not those kinds of, of, of pious admonitions going forward. So, I think, Paul, again, to answer your question, that we look at catch and release in a pan of grease versus catch and release, and there's the gap there. So how do we meet that? And, and part of that is for us to study the slot limit and to understand what's sustainable and not sustainable. And that efficiency then meets reality for people. And then they don't see us as coming to take something essential away from them. Great. 
Well, um, I realize that I have gone 10 minutes over our allotted time. Um, and I guess I should, I should close, but I, I will just uh, kind of call your attention, Drew, to the questions that were put in the Q&A and see if you could address some of those and, and probably, I hope, respond uh, broadly so that folks can see that. Um, I really appreciate uh, you kind of trying to expand all of our, our brains as much as possible, because initially we thought we wanted to be able to be think boldly in this couple of days and think out of our boxes, which we all are in. And um, I really appreciate your time. So I'm gonna close this morning with um, just uh, uh, very quickly to say thanks to all the presenters, all the panelists, and uh, look forward to the afternoon session where we're gonna have the joint venture coordinators join us and um, some of the core people working on the organizing committee for Road to Recovery to kind of reflect on the future. So please join us in about 40 minutes uh, and we'll see you then. Thank you.